have you ever really been uh, taken in? Do kids still do April Fool's Day stuff, really? Yeah, I can hear the sound of my tires blowing up from here. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, when I, when I, uh, think of April Fool's Day, I think of the, of the one time I, oh, twice, twice I was taken in, just fantastic. You ever, you ever been taken in by such an old gag that it wasn't being taken in that bugged you? It was that it was such an old rotten joke. I'm, I was a kid, and I, I must have been about, well, I can tell you exactly. I was in Miss Harris's class, which is sixth grade. And I was taken in by an April Fool joke. And uh, I was kind of, you know, I was quiet. I was sitting in the back of the room there, minding my own business. And uh, there was this girl who everybody in class was madly in love with. Every every class has this type of girl. And she was untouchable, absolutely. Her name was Patty Romaley. And uh, you've heard me talk about Patty Romaley. She was, uh, I'll tell you what she looked like. Do you remember a cartoon strip? I don't know whether it's still around or not, but uh, do you remember a cartoon strip called Boots and Her Buddies? Well, I admit, it might not have been out here in the East. Did you hear of it, Lee? Boots and Her Buddies? Well, Boots and Her Buddies, this girl Boots that was in this cartoon strip looked exactly like Patty Romaley. And, uh, in fact, I used to call her that. And she was blonde, uh, a real cheerleader type. And, uh, well, she was a little precocious, let us say, for sixth grade. And, um, and, you know, her glands were working. Everything was working, see. And, and uh, the only way our glands were working at that point, uh, they were creating pimples. But, um, yeah, and, and, and Patty would sit up there, and she would sort of float through the whole world that we lived in, untouched by it. And she was always going out with elderly men, you know, like guys from eighth grade. And, uh, <laughs> well, they were. You know, it's a guy named Billy Clark who, who everybody was bugged with because he was in eighth grade. And he used to say, oh, come, he doesn't go on with girls his own age. Wow. And he was in eighth grade. She was in sixth grade. And uh, she was always hanging around with Billy Clark. And Schwartz used to get bugged. And Schwartz, Schwartz had a real thing on her. And uh, the only trouble was that Schwartz was four feet ten. And uh, Patty was five feet six. As I said, she was very precocious. She had everything going for her. And she never, absolutely never... Never, never had anything to do with anybody in our class. The only guy that ever came close to uh, actually getting her to say hello was Jack Robertson. And Jack was about six feet three at that time. Well, he, he wasn't exactly precocious. He, he was just tall. He was six feet three. He weighed about 70 pounds. And, you know, and, uh, and most of his six feet three uh, was uh, kind of pimply. And, and uh, he, he, he actually got her going a little bit there for a while. But she drifted on and, and became part of that great, glamorous world of the kids who were in eighth grade, all the top light kids. But uh, she always was in our class all the time, and sort of on top of it. And you know how, if you ever had men, I think, have this uh, impression a lot. Men have the, the impression secretly inside that most women were born knowing about everything. And, uh, I mean, even they're dumb women. I don't mean everything. I mean, uh, how, to buy, how to buy stamps and stuff like that. But I mean the real stuff. And uh, Patty would look at us with these mis mysterious eyes. And uh, Schwartz would uh, kind of break out and sweat. And Patty Romaley. And Patty lived at the end of the street. She lived about a block and a half away from school. And we would go past Patty's house all the time. And every time we did, there would be this little excitement. Is Patty going to come out? Is Patty watching me hit this ball? Is Patty watching me? She never was. Patty didn't know we were alive. But the one day, I was sucked right in. Of course, like everybody else in the class, I was kind of bugged on, you know, hung up on Patty Romaley. And the, the day, it was on April 1st. We were in Miss Harris's class. It was sixth grade. And uh, this was in, late in the, well, this was late in the second ice age. And I'm sitting back there, and it's summertime. And I had never heard of T.S. Eliot. April is the cruelest month. All that jazz. And all April meant to me was that, you know, you play ball again. It was warm. And you could hear the peepers out in the swamp hollering. And you could feel the sun coming down on the top of your head. And uh, the kids were always out playing volleyball out next to the school. And I'm sitting in class. And Miss Harris is up there working away with the chalk. And all of a sudden, Helen Weathers who was sitting right next to me and off to my right. Helen Weathers gets a note handed to her from the kid in front of her. 
and it's all folded up. And she looks at it, and I'm just said I never got notes. No, I'm just sitting in there. The only notes I ever got were bad news. Once in a while from the office, you know, that kind of stuff. Take it home to your mother. And uh, <laughs> that was always, you know, real rotten. And I'm sitting there and paying no attention to anything, and I'm chewing on an eraser, and, and uh, the sun is coming down, and Patty Romali's nimbus of blonde hair is catching the glint of the April day way up ahead of me there. It's completely untouchable. It's like uh, the golden fleece. You don't... After a while, if you're... If you're really, after a while, if you're in the same class, friends, with... Uh, Oh, say, somebody like, uh, oh, Vanessa Redgrave. You don't look at her anymore. She's just there. You know, it's untouchable. It's like, it's like if a guy's got a pad next to the Statue of Liberty. After a while, you're just used to it. You don't think anymore about it. Just unattainable, and that's it. You just live with it. And so, <laughs> it's true, you know. And so, Patty Romaine is sitting up there in her hair. He's catching the sun coming, drifting down. And the class is droning on. It is April 1st. And uh, Helen Weathers gets this note. And she turns and he hands it to me. So here's a note. I said, well, what? I look at it, and it says, Shepard, it is a note to me. Well, I take the note, and I open it up, and it says, Dear Jean, I am madly in love with you. I can hardly bear not seeing you all the time, every hour of the day and night. You are fantastic. What a gas you are. And the way you wear that red corduroy cap is incredible. What a fantastic red corduroy cap. And boy, do you ever play second base great? I'm in love with you. X, 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 Patty Romaley. And my eyeballs popped open. You know, this is a, this is an incredible revelation. Now, I had heard of things like this. I had heard of, you know, secret loves once in a while. We read, you know, we had read uh, Ivanhoe, for example. And we knew that, I mean, I knew theoretically then that these fantastic loves existed. But Patty Romaley is in love with me and nobody's looking. I'm sitting, I got this note. And it's written in this girlish hand with a little... You know, girls always dot their eyes by making little circles. And uh, there's a certain kind of girl that does that. I never knew a male that did that, at least a male who didn't wear fluffy shirts and elf shoes. But uh, nevertheless, there it was in green ink, little circles. It says, I am madly in love with you. And the way you wear that corduroy cap is fantastic. Whew! Patty or My God. And I stick the note in my pocket. I sit there. And I see this head up there. She doesn't look around or anything. The sun is coming down, catching those blonde curls. And, uh, boy, I said, well, she's probably, she's probably, uh, bashful about it. Gee whiz, I, just, I wonder why she didn't say anything about this before. How come I didn't get a valentine from Patty Romaley, you know? The only valentine I got was from Fat Helen Weathers. And uh, she said to me, I remember Fat Helen Weathers turning to me before she gave me the valentine... She says, before I give you this valentine, you got to promise to give me one. I said, okay, so we exchange valentines. <laughs> the only girl that gave me a valentine. <laughs> I was the only boy that gave Helen Weathers a valentine, too, you know. So, you know, it was just a kind of... So we weren't shut out, skunked entirely. And so, speaking of being skunked, this is W.O.R. New York. Bring me on my salute music, please. <laughs> Gang, let's sing. This is the self-expression rag.
<laughs> Speaking of April Fool. However, uh, I got to get back to the story because this this is very important. I know I know that uh, this kind of emotional uh, problem has uh, plagued many a person, and uh, it's terrible to be faked out. And of course, most of us spend most of our lives getting faked out in one way or another. You know, I'm sitting there, you know, last maybe two or three rows. I'm way back there in the ghetto of the classroom. You know, the Schwartzes and the Shepherds and the Zinsmeisters were in the back there. And um, Miss Harris, who was a very petite lady, uh, Miss Harris was the, the, the compact kind of lady. Uh, looks a little bit like all the ladies that are in the girls. Have you noticed that all the girls in Mary Worth look exactly alike? He just puts on glasses on some of them, takes glasses off. Uh, all the men look bugged. You know, so ne- ne- <laughs> every male in uh, Mary Worth looks exactly alike, and they all look mad. And the girls always want to be an actress, and Mary Worth somehow moves in with them. What an old busybody. What a pain in the neck. And not, not only that, have you noticed that Mary Worth is getting younger every day? Of course, uh, now you know that's all part of the whole scene. She's probably taking wheat germ and estrogens and all that stuff. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Miss Harris looked like all those girls that were in... Mary Worth. You notice that all the all the uh, connotations here, since we're all Americans in this together, are comic strip connotations. Uh, just like, uh, well, uh, 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 movies are comic strips. Uh, they're, they're just expensive comic strips. You, t- you see Bonnie and Clyde. Now, now Bonnie and Clyde is a kind of watered-down Dick Tracy episode. And, uh, Mr. Ratface. Or, uh, <laughs> well, remember those terrible people? Remember the guy, the, the guy in... And Dick Tracy that had the flies around his face all the time. What a, what a, ooh, ugh. Uh, remember the mole? Any of you remember the mole? He lived underground. He looked like a mole. He had these feet that were webbed. And uh, well, You can always tell criminal types. They, they, they look like it. They've got flies around their head or they've got bullet holes for their ears and that kind of stuff. Just a rat face. And, uh, I knew a guy who really was a rat face, but that's, that's something else. He was a rotten, crummy lion face, is what I heard. <laughs> that's something else. That came out in court. However, that's that's an in joke, and uh, it's too late for in jokes. We got to get right down to the nitty gritty. I mean, you know, you play around with in jokes all you want, you get nowhere. But uh, I'm sitting in the back there, and I got this note. See, I'm about to be euchred, and it, you can see it stuck with me. I, I remember it to this day. I mean, it was a vivid moment, and it said, "Dear Jean, holy smokes, am I in love with you? You are an incredible, fantastic human being. The way you play second base is a gas." And the way you make that slide into third is just incredible. And I like the way you wear that corduroy red hat. Signed, Patty Romaley. Well, now, Patty Romaley, uh, uh, maybe I'm not getting it across to you what kind of a, a symbol Patty Romaley was. First of all, Patty Romaley was rich. Patty Romaley just didn't have an ordinary walking around family. Patty Romaley only came to the Warren G. Harding School because her parents felt that she should know something about the hoi polloi. And we were the hoi polloi. Well, she was there studying us, you know, like bugs. And she did not take part in our little bug-like games under any circumstances. So here's old Patty sitting up there in the front there. And, oh, another thing about Patty Romaley. She was so remote that, at, uh, as far as my knowledge is concerned, Patty Romaley never attended any kid parties. We were at these parties, you know, to play spin the bottle. And me and Schwartz and Helen Weathers and... Esther Jane Allberry are playing spin the bottle, you know. And uh, we'd go, uh, you know, the bottle, you'd spin it, and it would spin around, and whoever it points to, they were it then. And then uh, they had to spin the bottle. Well, there were all kinds of variations, see. And then whoever it pointed to, they had a kiss. You know, that was the whole thing. And it was terrible, you know. It, it, it's awful being kissed by Schwartz. You know, that, <laughs> you just can't trust a board and milk bottle. And they, yeah, oh, yeah, guys played with loaded milk bottles, eh, that... Uh, they were, they're, in love and war, there are no rules, friends. And uh, I can remember one time playing, uh, you remember, remember Drop the Clothespin? You ever play that game? It's a great game. You stand up and you drop clothespins into a bottle. I don't exactly know the ground rules. It never got to be an Olympic sport, but I was very good at dropping clothespins in the milk bottles. But I'll tell you one thing. Patty Romaley never showed up at those Bacchanalian orgies. Patty Romaley would never get stuck in a spin-the-bottle game with me and Schwartz and Flick, ever. She never even said anything to us, not even hello. Patty never said things like, get out of my way. She just walked through the halls. This magnificent blonde image, this this uh, glorious nimbic nymph 
standing next to an eternal elfin pool, deep in the heart of a forest of, of erotic desire, such as we knew it at the time. Erotic desire consisted mainly of uh, looking at magazines in George's bowling alley where they had the magazine rack. And once in a while, George would belch you on the back of the neck. You are not supposed to be looking at spicy detective. And, uh, <laughs> and that's about all it was, you know, uh, not much more than that. But Patty represented something unattainable. She represented, among other things, friends, the outside world. Now, what was the outside world? Well, the outside world was the world where people went on uh, things like uh, slaying parties. And we would hear rumors that Patty Romaley went on a slaying party, you know, things like that. Or uh, Patty Romaley spent the summer at a place called The Lake. He spent the summer in the alley back of Schwartz's house. <laughs> she was always going to a place called The Camp. And we would hear that Patty Romaley would spend two weeks in a place called Maine. So, you know, this was another scene entirely from our daily grubbing life. And to get a note from Patty Romaley saying that Patty Romaley can't sit still, she can't stand the fantastic pangs of love because of the way you wear your, your red corduroy hunting cap. Man. So you can understand. <laughs> I get this now. Well, at first I didn't believe it. See, I said, oh, come on. Oh, gee. But such is the drive of desire. Such is the ability of mankind to rationalize the obvious, ridiculous plight that he's in. I, my first impression, I, that's ridiculous. Then I says, well, why not? You know. Maybe it's true. And I'm breaking out my cold sweat, right? In the middle of arithmetic class. And Patty is sitting up there, the nimbus of hair drifting and that beautiful sunlight coming in through the Venetian blinds. And my thoughts, of course, ran to this kind of thing. Oh, Patty, why didn't you tell me? Why have we kept this a secret so long? Why have you allowed me to play footsie and the hanky-panky with Esther Jane Alberry for so long? Me and Esther Jane, there's nothing between us. You know, nothing really. Except we throw rocks once in a while at each other. That's about all. But the, why have you allowed this charade to go on? Patty Romaley, when a true love could have been consummated, or at least, uh, you know, something. We could have, uh, you know, we could have made Flick mad by walking home together. Or something. I didn't know exactly what you, you know, <laughs> what, what, what love means. Love is, you know, it's a thing kids write on notes and stuff like that. But I can tell you this, man. I mean, that was the first time, I'm serious, the first time that I spontaneously broke into a multifaceted sweat. And I remember it vividly to this day. Well, the first, you know what I'm talking about, Larry. The first <laughs> yeah, Larry looks rueful. He says, yeah. <laughs> Do you ever wonder whether girls feel that? Do you ever really wonder that, Larry? I have. I've, you know, but, uh, you know, that's just an idle uh, scholastic wonder. It doesn't really have anything to do with life. And I've, I've often wondered, uh, how, would, how, would, how would it actually be in the world if uh, women were people, too? <laughs> no telling. Well, nevertheless, here I am. You know, I've got this this tremendous chick is in love with me now, and and not only in love with me, but she says the right things. Now, the best thing I owned at that time was this red corduroy cap that I had. It's the best thing, you know. And it was a great cap, and uh, and she she noticed that, and uh, you could tell this is real love. And and I did like to. I was a second baseman, and I did like to play second base. And the, she noticed the way I laid the tag on Schwartz and Flick when they come sliding in there. You know, I'd get Schwartz right in the eye once in a while and lay one of them Flick's teeth. And, and the, she noticed those things. That's the right thing for a girl to say to a guy, you know. And the fact that she could not stand any longer us being apart. Well, there's only one thing to do. So I'm sitting there in the back. And by George, about 3 o'clock that afternoon, about an hour before school is out, another note is handed to me from Helen Weathers. And it's a grubby note. Helen Weathers has got this mad look. Helen Weathers always wore her hair like Prince Valiant. You know, <laughs> it always looked like she was wearing a football helmet. And, uh, <laughs> and she was fat. She, she looked like a football, you know, with a football helmet on top and Prince Valiant. And uh, she would hand me this note. And she's sweating. She's mad. Here's another note. And I'd look at the note. And this one, this one said, Dear Jean, would you please come to my house tonight? And I will make fudge. I, I must see you after school tonight. Would you please come to my house about 
I must see you. Please, do not disappoint me. Signed, your one and only true love. You are fantastic, and I like the way you wear your red, that red hat. Please come to my house today at 4.30. My mother will not be there, and we will make fudge. Signed, your Patty. Patty Romali. My Patty Romali. I mean, you know, holy smokes. Oh, what? And, and she is sitting up and doesn't look back. Nothing. Of course, you, you would expect this of a sophisticated uh, girl of the world. You know, she's not going to. She's going to look back and wave at me. And we're in geography class. You know, wave, say, hey, hi, hi, you know. And so uh, I'm sitting all the way through the next class, and now school is over. And I, and, and I had planned to sell seeds this afternoon. You see, because of the, uh, always in the first April, April 1st, maybe up through about the 15th, uh, we had in the school, Warren G. Harding had a thing on selling seeds. Now, I don't know what the hell we were selling seeds for and what we were supposed to get out of it, but all I know is that I spent every afternoon during those days going up and down on, on porches and walks and knocking on doors and asking people if they wanted to grow nasturtiums. And they would look out. Half of, you know, it, it amazed me. I never knew at that time how many people slept till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Uh, once you're a door-to-door -door salesman, and when, uh, you know, I was a door-to-door -door salesman, and I had my little package of seeds, and, and we were supposed to be getting an, an encyclopedia set which we never got. Every every year we were working <laughs> on this book, <laughs> you know, world book and all that stuff. And I'd go up and I'd knock on the door and, and these these haggard eyes would look out of the darkness and you could see just a little hint of stubble there. It was like, a, a, you know, like, like some kind of a monster in a cave and I'd, the door would open. This, these eyes would look out and I'd say, well, what do you want? I'd say, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm from uh, Warren G. Harding School, and do you want any nasturtiums? I've brought you nasturtium seeds for this, this year. He said, oh, shut up. Nasturtiums, boom. The door had slammed. Well, you know, we'd taken a course. Yeah, uh, part, by the way, part of our seed thing, we had taken a course in salesmanship. And uh, we started this with Miss Shields. And she says, never ask people if they want nasturtium seeds. Because then they'll tell you. Never ask them. Tell them that you have brought their nasturtium seeds. You see, that's the positive approach. Say to people, I have brought your nasturtium seeds for this summer. And <laughs> you'd be surprised at the answers you get to that one. The rarest one of all is, well, okay, how much are they? That happens about once every 258 tries. And so I had been planning all afternoon, you know, I was going to go over on Cleveland Street and sell some more seeds. And uh, I figured, well, the hell with the seeds. And so I rushed, <laughs> I rushed home and uh, I got all, you know, combed my hair and, Put on a, uh, I had a, these. I was going through my J.C. Penney checkered western shirt phase, and uh, they, you know, those red and black and uh, yellow checkered shirts, lumberjack shirt phases. They were really great. I, I figured that was really. It made a statement. They were flannel, hotter than heck, but uh, they were flannel. You've had those, and I had on my red, my red base. I figured if she liked my red corduroy cap, I better wear that. So I put on my red corduroy cap. I'm all dressed up, and and uh, I go out and. Schwitz and Frank and Broner. You, you don't want to hear the... This is a very painful story, see? <laughs> They're playing balls. <laughs> and a whole bunch of Jack Ramson. And, and I go down the street, and Schwartz says, Hey, come on, here comes Shep. Okay, let's choose up again. I said, No, I can't play. What do you mean you can't play? No, I can't play. I have important business. What do you mean important business? I ain't going to sell... Well, come on, uh, forget the seeds today. Come on, let's go. I am not going to sell seeds. I have important business. Oh, for crying out loud. What the heck? Wah, wah, wah. Well, you know, love. The first awakening and all that stuff, you, you cannot you cannot turn aside. So I go down the street and I figured I better be careful. If I walk down the street to Patty's house, I mean, you know, that is really tipping the gap. So I went around the block. I figured I'm gonna euchre them, say I pretend so I turn left and I go down the block and I go down the alley <laughs> and I'm faking it. See, I go down around back of the school and I go back of the Sherwin Williams paint sign and I cut through a couple of vacant lots. And I'm trying to wait until it is now time to go in and see her, see, 4 30. And I've got this Mickey Mouse watch, which had great time. Had these two big hands with yellow gloves, with the yellow gloves pointing <laughs> one hand. And the, my Mickey Mouse watch was uh, like a, well, I, I, you had to play it like a golf slice. The trouble with my, my watch was, was that the minute hand was loose. And if you jiggle it a little bit, it would spin around about nine times. You never know really what time it was. And so I would always judge it by the hour hand. See, it was pointing halfway between four, and it's now 4.30. So I, 
I go sneaking back down Cleveland Street, and I see the ball game is over. Nobody has, nobody, nobody's playing ball, so I figure they've gone down to the Aschenschlager store or something to get some root beer barrels or something. So I go sneaking along the street, and man, the excitement. Oh, it's fantastic excitement. And I'm really, really hung with this thing. Patty Romaley is going to make fudge. And now her house. I had never been in her house. It was at the end of the street, and it was kind of aloof just because it was her house. It was like it was kneeling. And, uh, you know, it was a girl house. It was a Patty Romaley house. And I'd walk past it practically every day of my life, and I'd just think, oh, Patty Romaley lives in there. Patty Romaley eats supper in that house. She walks around in there. Believe me, friends, there are no more beautiful months ever than April. April is not only the cruelest month, it is the most dangerous month. April is the time when even Met fans have the illusion that the Mets are going to play baseball this year instead of a beanbag or whatever it is that they play in July. That's the trouble with April. April gives people the idea that it's a new year and that uh, because it is April, things are going to be different this year. This year, they're going to uh, actually buy those fantastic Bermuda shorts and that uh, the every day they're going to be at Jones Beach. They're going to utilize every minute of the beautiful already. Some of the warm days have slipped by, and you have done nothing. So that should be a clue. You're, you're letting it squeeze through your fingers again. But the trouble with April is that it is a cruel month, and it is a beautiful month, and a dangerous month. But I didn't know any of that in those days. To me, April was the month you sold seeds. And, uh, <laughs> you had Arbor Day and that kind of stuff. And the sun is trickling down on Cleveland Street and bouncing off the roofs. And uh, you can see the Sherman Williams paint sign was glowing, and they had just repainted it. You know, that big globe, and uh, there's a big can of paint pouring over the top of the globe, and it says, we'll cover the earth, or it covers the earth. What is their slogan exactly? Covers the earth? Isn't it symbolic that that paint is red? No, I, I, every time I look at that, I think that's a symbolic a symbolic trademark. But, uh, you know, at that time, it was just a trademark, and there was the Sherman. We always played behind the paint sign, and the sun is hanging over it, and I am all excited, knocking on Patty Romaley's door. I knock. I knock again. And then I hear something stirring inside. I hear people moving around. I knock again. And uh, the door opens, and of course my first thought was to say, uh, I have brought you nasturtium seeds, because that's what I always did when people opened doors. <laughs> knock on the door. And uh, there is Mrs. Romaley, who, by the way, was an exact duplicate of Patty Romaley, only more so. Boy, she was a high-octane lady. Now that I look back on it, <laughs> she was something else. And uh, Mrs. Romaley looks out at me and said, Yes? Well, you know, this was not going according to the script right away because I had gotten a note from Patty Romaley saying that Mrs. Romaley or Mama Romaley would not be here and that the two of us would have an idyllic afternoon making fudge. And here was Mrs. Romaley. Yes. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, Patty home? She said, uh, who shall I say is calling? Uh, well, uh, you know, I figured, you know, Patty is now back in some room in the subterranean caverns of the Romaley house, dying of unrequited love. That the, she is probably back there sweating bullets and thinking of this magnificent human being in the red corduroy cap. And the, I said, the, well, would you uh, tell Patty that uh, I'm here? She said, well, who are you? Well, me. I'm... And then I hear Patty. <laughs> I hear her in the next room. One of the rare times that I actually heard her voice. You know, when it wasn't dripping with sarcasm. I hear her say, Mother, who's, who's out there? Somebody asking for me? And she turned, Mrs. Romani turned, and said one of the worst things that's ever been said about me ever. She said, Yes, Patty, there's some little kid here. Some little kid here. And she said, who is it? And Mrs. Romaley turned to me and says, who are you? <laughs> I said, uh, tell her Jean's here. And there's a dead silence, because obviously Patty heard this. And Patty said, Jean? Jean who? And she says, 
Who is... What's your last name, little boy? I said, Gene Shepard. Now, I, I, I better not go on with this because I can see 50 million people are dying of embarrassment. This is exactly what happened, friends, and, and it became a legend of the myth in northern Indiana. Today, folk singers are singing about this. I mean, it was one of those awful moments in history, you know, like Casey Jones riding old 98 to disaster. And I said, Gene Shepard. And Patty Romani said, Gene Shepard, Mother, uh, tell him that we don't want any seeds. I said, I'm, I, I'm not here for seeds. Tell Patty that I, I'm, I'm here. I... And she said, yes. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. And uh, Mrs. Romaley turned and said, that, well, Patty, he says he's here. And Patty, <laughs> Patty said, tell him, tell him that I'll see him in school tomorrow or something. What does he want? What does he want? And I didn't know what to say to Mrs. Romani. I said, well, tell Patty that uh, I, I want to ask her if she got the, the third problem, the arithmetic. That's all I could think of. And Patty said, yes, the answer is 32. I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> and Mrs. Romani says, is that all, little boy? I said, Yes. She said, well, uh, bye. I said, bye. And my hat, you know, it was the first time I noticed that my corduroy hat weighed 72 pounds. And, and uh, yeah, it was hanging down over my ears, and I was sweating in it. I said, bye. And she closed the door. And I turned, and I looked out, and the sun is coming down to the trees. And I see that Sherwin-Williams paint sign there. At the... School, the Warren G. Hung School is sitting off there in the distance. And I could see all the, all the, all the cutouts of the paper stuff that the kids in kindergarten were making were in the, in the windows there. And I walked across the porch and I go down the steps. And I had the feeling that Patty Romaney was looking through the curtains at me. And I, what do you do? And I get about five feet from the steps, friends. When the denouement occurred, I heard from somewhere off in the middle distance a fiendish cackle. <laughs> you are such a fantastic person. <laughs> I love you. Wah, wah, wah. And it is coming from under somebody's porch. It is coming from under Patty Romaley's porch. Then I hear... <laughs> See, all the tulips are growing up there and beginning to blossom. This is, by the way, why I've always hated tulips ever since. I used to like tulips when I was a simple, unspoiled person of five. But after this moment, tulips had another connotation. Here were the tulips growing up there, and I looked at the tulips, and I could see about 37 fiendish, evil eyes peering out from under Patty Romaley's porch. They heard... And the cackling, the cackling rose. Would you please give me a little of that, that idiotic piano music to show them? I was a buffoon. Huh, friends, have you ever wondered how... You've all seen Charlie Chaplin? How it felt to be that buffoon? I don't mean Charlie Chaplin playing him. I mean being him. I'm walking down the street, my feet are going out sideways. And I could hear this... <laughs> Second base, right? Schwartz and Flick and Boner, Jack Robertson, Grover Dill, Farkas, the whole damn bunch. It is the entire crowd from sixth grade, all of them. Me, 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 me. <sighs> Humiliated before the entire world. They heard. And I couldn't figure out why they did it to me. Why did they do this to me? And then I heard Schwartz say, April Fool's Day, mama! It's April Fool's Day. I have bitten for them. 
you know, to this day, I don't know whether or not Patty Romaley ever heard about it, but she couldn't possibly. She couldn't possibly have not heard. She was also part of that little hardy band of searchers after truth, after culture. Some nights, early in the spring, when I'm walking through Central Park amid the beds of flowers and I see those those friendly little tulips looking up with their tongues sticking out at me and the sun shining down over General Sheridan's statue and all the pigeons are flapping around doing what pigeons always do around statues I can hear those fiendish cackles and uh, I can say one thing Patty Romanley never mentioned that that insane episode out of my checkered life never And you know that not more than a year ago, I am home. I'm walking down the street. And who comes out of the A&P looking even more high-octane than ever before? Patty Romaley. And my first impression is, don't even notice her. And she looked at me and says, why, Jean, how are you? She remembered me. Thank God, there's still hope. I said, hi, Jean, Patty Romaley. How are you? She said, well, how are you? I said, how are you? She said, well, you've grown. I said, well, you know, you, those things happen. You know, sun hits you and you grow. We stood there for a minute. You know, I thought, should I pour it all out? Then I said, no, 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 I'm a grown-up man. I said, well, it's good seeing you, Patty. She says, uh, do you still have that red corduroy hat? I said, yeah. And we walked our separate ways. April 4th, W.O.R. New York.